Okay, I think we're live. I'll just wait for people to jump on. It says live. Hey, people are jumping on now. Great, great. Welcome to my home. This is my office in my home. Now, I have a, a question to get us started while people are getting on uh, that you can write in the comments and I'll, I'll read your responses. I want you to put your favorite war movie. Your favorite war movie. Now, if you don't, like uh, war movies, you can put your favorite superhero movie. And if you don't like superhero movies, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't have another one. So, put in your favorite war movie or superhero movie. Let's see what we get. Anybody in the comments? Does nobody like superhero movies or war movies put in the comments your favorite superhero movie or your favorite war movie i swear it's going to relate this isn't just for fun it is fun but it's not just for fun hexall ridge forrest gump question mark i think that counts i think forrest gump counts avengers endgame ha another one for hexall ridge Love and basketball. I, Caleb, I don't think that counts. Uh, <laughs> love is a battlefield, though, so I don't know. Maybe. Hacksaw Ridge, Hacksaw Ridge. Hacksaw Ridge was really good, I, I admit. In the comments, while we're waiting for people to log on, you can put your favorite war movie or, <laughs> or your favorite superhero movie. Downton Abbey Season 2. Um... No, no, that's not a, that's not a, I'm sorry, that's not a war movie. There is war in the season. And I know that because Sasha and I, we did watch Downton Abbey for, for a while. What we found out about it, it's good, don't get me wrong, it's good, but it's basically just a sophisticated soap opera. That's, that's what Downton Abbey is. Lord of the Rings is out there, let's see, 1917. I also saw 1917, and uh, that's close to my favorite. Either that or Saving Private Ryan. One of those two. Schindler's List, I think that counts. Gladiator. Tombstone is a war movie. We're, we're stretching it here, but I think we'll, we'll count that, Mr. Hastings. <laughs> Saving Private Ryan. Yas! Exclamation point. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started with our passage. I know people are still getting on, um, but we're going, going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to keep it short and sweet today. So we're in Philippians 1, 27 through 2, 4. So Philippians 1, 27 through 2, 4. If you have your New Life booklet, it is number 9. If you don't, that's completely okay. You can order it on Amazon, and it, even if you're afraid to do that, you can just open up your Bible to Philippians. We'll start in verse uh, 27. Philippians 1, starting in verse 27. So I'm going to go ahead and pray for us and ask God to bless this time, and we'll get started with the passage. Father, we just ask you to teach us. We ask that we would humble ourselves before you. We just pray that in this time of uncertainty, uh, that we wouldn't stop looking to you. In fact, that we would look to you even more. Help us to understand your word. Amen. Okay, so I'm just going to read verse 27 and it'll get us started. Verse 27 says this, Just one thing. As citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. 
He says, because you are now citizens of heaven, this is your identity, you're a citizen of heaven, live your life in a way that's worthy of Christ. Now, this phrase, worthy, is, is really interesting. The Greek is axios. And it means to have value, to, uh, to meet how important something is. And if there is a way of living that's worthy of the gospel of Christ, then that also means that there's a way that we can live as Christians that is not worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, before you push the heretic button, like that's some sort of way of um, winning God's favor or something like that, it's, it's not like that at all. That does not, this principle doesn't decrease the value of grace. In fact, it actually increases it. Grace is so immense, the grace of God and the salvation of God is so beautiful, so immense, that it actually demands a certain life. There's a, a correct way of responding to it. It'd be like someone coming to you and saying, hey, I want to pay off all your student debt. Boom. And your response was, cool. It's like, it, that wouldn't make any, any sense given the gravity of the gift. So he says, live your life in a way worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then he continues, Then whether I come and see you or am absent, I will hear about you that you are standing... Okay, now he's going to explain what a life worthy of Christ is. So if Paul, the Apostle Paul, says this is a life that's worthy of Christ, I want to like lean in and be like, okay, what is it? Like, what is a life that's worthy of the gospel of Christ? And this is what it says. Standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel. He's saying, as a church, you're standing one spirit, one accord, contending for the gospel, working together. Now, the reason why I mentioned war movies or your favorite superhero movie is almost all of them have a very common thread. And the common thread is a team working together for a common purpose. You know, sometimes like in 1917 that I mentioned, it's just two guys. They're working together for a common purpose. Or uh, I recently rewatched um, the first Captain America movie. And it's not really a, a highlight of the film, but there's this little team, this makeshift team, and they all have their different skills and their little quirks, and they're all kind of weird. And, but they accomplish big things in the movie. And over and over and over again, and this is not just war movies or superhero movies, it's seen all over the place. And the reason why it's like that is deep down, every single one of us, we want to be a part of a group of people that accomplishes something big. And not only do we want to accomplish something big, we want all of our different gifts and our quirks and our we want we want to be a part of it in a very unique and important way so he's saying you know a life that's worthy of the gospel you're together with one spirit one accord and you're contending for something you're fighting for something last night uh, in our cf goes live we talked about taking strategic risks strategic risks and we talked about like in World War II um, taking the beaches of Normandy was a strategic a strategic risk like it wasn't just oh, okay here on the map I guess we'll take that no they they thought it through and they took a risk and we want to do the same thing with our lives but we don't just want to do it as individuals we want to contend for the gospel as a group we want to find people to link arms with and say, okay, this is the direction we're going and we're going to accomplish something. Now, it continues, verse 28. Not being frightened in any way by your opponents. He, he says this. Paul doesn't say things at random. He says it because it would be a common thing. It would be a common thing to be frightened. When you start, um, when you start to engage to continue the, the war analogy, when you start to engage the enemy, you shouldn't be surprised that bullets start to fly. And he's saying, don't be frightened. This is a sign of destruction for them, but, salvation, uh, but of your salvation, and this is from God. 
So when the bullets start to fly, it is judgment on the people shooting the bullets, but it's also an assurance to you of like, oh, wow, you know, this is actually something that's, that's happening. I remember receiving my first real pushback for gospel ministry. And it didn't make sense in my mind. I'm like, why would this be happening? Why would be, people be responding like this? And it really, like I believed it was true, but something just went down my heart a few levels of like, oh, it's actually true. Like this is an actual battle going on, an actual spiritual battle going on. Then verse uh, 29, it says, For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I have. So he's saying, this has been given to you. This struggle, this suffering has been given to you by Jesus. And he equates this giving to the gift of belief and their salvation. So... Jesus, when he gives gifts, he doesn't just say, okay, here you go, salvation. Here, here's a gift. That's not his only gift. He also gives struggle and suffering. In fact, he promises it. For anyone who lives righteous in Christ Jesus, there will be persecution. He, it's a promise from God. That's not typically the, the promise you put on a coffee mug, you know, or right when you walk into a house, but it is a promise of God that there will be struggle. And this is something that we can, uh, This verses like this are actually really comforting in times where it's really hard or uncertain. And because God is the creator of the universe, like he not only gave me my salvation, but he gave me, he, he dealt, he gave me the deck in which I'm playing with. He, he gave me these, these struggles. And that, and I know that I can continue in them because um, he has given them to me. Now, this doesn't mean that he's the author of evil. That, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is it's a part of his story. There's nothing in the universe that's not a part of his story. Okay, let's go to the, the next verse. Verse 1 of uh, chapter 2. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection of mercy, make my joy complete by... Okay, dot, dot, dot. So he's saying if there's really any spiritual legitimacy, that's basically what he's saying. If, you in, if you're encouraged in Christ, if you have a consolation of love, if you have love in your heart, if you have fellowship with the Spirit, if you have genuine affection, genuine mercy, he's piling up all of these uh, different words to say, okay, if there's anything going on inside of you, now this. Now this. And then he, he not only applies it to the readers, but he applies it to himself. You know, even if you don't have any of that you could do it for me. That's what he said. You could do it for me. You could make my joy complete. So again, it's just like live the life worthy of the gospel. It's like, okay, this is a pretty important thing. If he's saying that if you have any of these things, then this, I should lean in. What is he going to say? Make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit with one purpose. So all of this is a drum roll. He's drumming it up, and it's going up. Now what? Same love, united in one spirit, and same purpose. The same thing he was talking about a few verses earlier. So a way that we actually show that God is at work in our life is that we're united with a group of people, and not just as a loving family. That is, that, that is a necessary component, that we're a loving family but it's also for the same purpose. If for the same, we're going in the same direction. And that's something that we can ask ourselves of like, am I a part of a community in which it's a loving family, but we're actually going somewhere? There's actually a, a mission that we're trying to accomplish. Now, the thing he ends with, he ends with the thing that destroys communities like that. It destroys the family aspect of a community, and it destroys uh, a missional focus of a community. 
Look at verse 3 of, of chapter 2. It says this, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Here's the thing. The thing that destroys family communities within the church, the thing that destroys a missional purpose of actually trying to accomplish the mission of God, the thing that destroys that is pride. Pride destroys that. And pride can be seen in so many different ways. I think this is why Paul kind of gives several layers of different examples. It can be seen in your motivation, your selfish ambition, and conceit, doing things so you look awesome. Like, that can destroy things. Because what happens is, unlike Paul, Paul said people are, he's in prison, people are preaching the gospel out of their own pride. He's like, yes, the gospel is being preached. It's okay, it's out of pride, but like the gospel is being preached. If we don't have that type of humility, we will not be like that. As soon as someone else gets more likes, as soon as someone else gets more attention, as soon as someone else... Um, does something in which everyone kind of shifts their focus and looks at them, we will be angry and bitter and jealous. And here's the thing, teams can't function that way. You, you can't accomplish anything that way. As the famous coach John Wooden said, it's amazing what you can accomplish when no one cares who gets the credit. It's there, if everyone is coming together and it says, all I want to happen is to lift up Jesus, then you can accomplish a lot. The next thing he says is to consider others more important than yourself. This is something I will, this is a verse I'll repeat in my head when I'm meeting with people or I'm having something that's really, I'm tempted to view something as a distraction. I'll think of this. This person that I'm talking to is before God just as important as I am. Just as important. They, God loves them and died for them just as much as He loves me and died for me. And one thing that we need to kill in our own soul is a protagonist mindset. Like, I'm the protagonist of the story, and we're not. God is the protagonist of the story. So I need to remind myself that other people are important to kill this pride which kills community. And the last thing is this. Everyone should look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Meaning, in our decision-making, other people should be a crucial role in the decisions we make. We are not just independent people going about slaying dragons. We are together. It'd be like one soldier. You know, there's a, a, a line of defense for the trenches of World War I and World War II, and one soldier just says, you know what, I'm going for it, and just starts running. It's like, that would never work. And what we do is when we make decisions, we think about the needs of others, we think about how it will affect other people and how it will accomplish the mission of God. And what this looks like, or what this is, is humility. There are no, there are no, there are no lone range cowboys in God's kingdom. And when there are, it just brings us so much destruction. So the question I have for you is, do you uh, think about other people when you make decisions? Okay, so Paul gives us uh, just a little recap of a life that is worthy of the gospel. And this is a life that's united in spirit, united in one accord for one singular purpose, to accomplish the purposes of God. Now, I want to end with one thing, and it's a challenge. One thing you can do when you spend time with God is to do what is called a word study. And a word study is when you find a word that seems really crucial in a text and you go and you look up how it's used uh, throughout the Bible and especially how it's used by the same author. Different authors in the Bible will use words differently. So this is my challenge to you. Do a word study of the word worthy worthy. Now, Paul uses the word worthy several times in his letters. And three other times, he uses a similar phrase of like, 
walk in a way worthy or live in a way worthy, he connects it to uh, the Christian's life. So a life that is worthy. And I'm going to give you those three passages. And if you don't, if you have a reading plan and you're already behind, by all means, focus on that. But if you need something to do for this, the, this next hour, which we're challenging you to spend time with God, here are four passages that you can look at. The first one is this passage, Philippians 1, 27 through 2, 4. The second one is 1 Thessalonians 2, 12. Ephesians 4, 1 is the third passage. And the fourth passage is Colossians 1, 10. I would challenge you to look up all of those verses and to really marinate yourself in a life that is worthy of the grace that God has given us. Thank you all for logging on today and focusing on the Word of God. Let's utilize this really unique time that God has given us. Let's pray for people. Let's serve the people that we're around. Let's be wise in the way that we interact with people. Um, Let's take care of ourselves and our neighbors for the glory of God. I'll see you guys. If I can actually finish how to turn this off, okay. Yeah, there you go.